we've only been a few weeks into this, but this last week, if you remember right, we kind of talked about the different aspects of God, the different roles that he fulfills, and we only hit on a few of them. There's certainly more than what we talked about, but we hit on some of the highlights. We talked about him being a prophet, a priest, a king, and father. You were supposed to repeat those with me because you remembered them so well from last week. It didn't happen. You want to try it again? Prophet, priest, king, and father. Oh, you guys are such good students. Um, And we're going to look at that again, uh, not exactly the same way though. This time we're going to look at the ways that we have conversation with the Father, the different kinds of categories that we can put prayer in, just because to understand something, sometimes it helps to to categorize it. So before we go any farther, I want to stop and pray. Well, Father, um, like your disciples before us, we, we come to you and we say, will you teach us how to pray? Not because you stopped communicating with us, but because we, like it says in Romans, have suppressed the truth and kind of turned off our ears from listening to you, and from talking to you. So God, uh, whatever gets in the way of our prayers, whatever wrong concepts we might have about prayer or about who you are, would you start to gently take those away from us this morning? And would you replace them, Lord, with right thinking and right living and right actions in the place of prayer. It helps us this morning not to be people that just hear a word and feel better about ourselves and walk away having not done anything about it, but make us people that hear your word and obey it, like the guy who built on a rock. Yeah, so we open our heart to you. We open our ears to you, and we we hold out our hands and say, uh, they're yours too. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so in, uh, in James chapter five, if, if you ever want to get really convicted, read James. You're looking at me like, I've never wanted to be really convicted. You should. You should want to be really convicted sometimes. Read James. Open up James and start reading. Uh, he talks about just about everything, and he nails us. But in chapter five, as he's starting to wrap up, he starts to talk about the area of prayer, and, and this is what he says. He says, is anyone among you in trouble, let them pray. Is anyone happy, let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick, let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they've sinned, they'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Do you hear what he's saying here? He's basically telling you to turn everything into prayer. Are you happy? Pray. (laughs) Are you sad? Sing the blues and pray. (laughs) Are you sick? Get people around you and pray. Give them the sickness. (laughs) Everything that comes at you, return it to God in prayer. It, and he's trying to, what he's trying to do is he's trying to speak to a community of people who say they believe and saying, if you believe, if you believe, then our conversation moves first towards God. Matter of fact, the, the very last line that he uses here, I, I really prefer it in King James. The, the, the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Isn't that great? The fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And, and that word man there is for mankind. It's men and women. The fervent prayer of righteous men and women availeth much. If we believe that, then we move that direction and we, we do it first. And in the, in the sermon this morning, what we're gonna try to do is take prayer and sort of group it into families. Not because they have to be grouped in the families. There's other ways of looking at prayer but I think this is a way that's gonna help us wrap our minds around the idea of prayer. You guys all remember biology class. Um, I, don't, I think I learned this in high school when you start categorizing all the living organisms. What are the different categories? Kingdom, phylum, class, order, order, family, genus, species. There you go. Hi, how are you? <laughs> she's my friend. And she's a smart one too. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And, and what it does is it just helps us categorize and lump things together. So we're going to kind of do that with prayer this morning. We're going to look at prayer in three families. The first 
family of prayer we're going to call upward prayer. And, and upward prayer is this place of adoration. Adoration. Uh, you could, you've heard it called other things maybe. Adoration isn't a word that we use a whole lot now unless we say things like adorable. Oh, that kid's adorable. And we've kind of made it a little bit smaller word than it really is. Because adoration is what, what we give to God. The second family of prayer is a, is a family we're going to call inward. That inward place of prayer is a place of confession, a place of repentance, a place of, of dealing with our heart and the things of our heart. And finally, the last place is outward prayer. And outward prayer is where we turn our attention towards others, not just ourselves and our needs, but we start looking around us and we start doing supplication or intercessory prayer is another thing that you've probably heard this called. Intercessory prayer is when you, you stand in between someone and maybe what they deserve or what they're about to get. And you're like, oh God, have mercy. But we're gonna start with this idea of upward prayer in the area of praise and adoration. And there's a reason for that. Because praise and adoration is primary it has to come first. It, it, it's, your prayer life is done best when you start in the place of praise. It's not just primary, it's necessary. There seems to be something in us as human beings that just kind of prays. Now, we don't naturally turn that to God since our brokenness, but we do like to kind of advocate things that we've enjoyed and we start to praise them, right? Oh man, have you? Have, have you had this lemon ginger tea? Mm. Delicious. <laughs> this tea will change your life. <laughs> right? Have you heard people just kind of go on about something that they've, uh, have, you, have you read, have, have you read this book yet? You haven't read this book? Oh my goodness. Oh. When, when, when she says, I offer myself as tribute, I just, <laughs> John Thorpe reading young adult for girls. I don't know what he's doing. Some of our worship leaders, I worry about him. You know, that, but when we really like something, we tend to tell people about it. We get excited about it. I, I, have you ever looked on the Amazon uh, reviews? I love looking on Amazon reviews. I don't know why. It's just something interesting to me about the kind of people that take the time after they've bought something to go back to Amazon and explain how much they liked it or didn't like it. And I, I really, I don't care about three star reviews. I don't care about two star reviews. I want the five star or the one star. I want the people that either absolutely loved it or hated it. And the ones that absolutely love it, there's just something fun about it. There's this one, uh, there's a wolf shirt on Amazon. I encourage you to go look up this wolf shirt on Amazon. There's three wolves howling at a moon. There are thousands of reviews for this t-shirt. And, and they go like, before I bought this wolf shirt, I was living on the streets. <laughs> Since putting on this shirt, my life has been imbued with magical powers. <laughs> I now have a six-figure income and a beautiful wife. <laughs> you should order this shirt. I mean, they just go over the top in their praise. <laughs> I, I'm not gonna lie to you, I own that wolf shirt. <laughs> I didn't get it on Amazon, I bought it at a truck stop, like all wolf, wolf shirts should be bought. <laughs> My wife hates it. I really mostly bought it because she hates it. <laughs> when she needs to be put in her place at home, I'll just go put on my wolf shirt. <laughs> you can't tell me what to do. <laughs> I can wear ugly clothes. <laughs> We're in counseling. <laughs> The part about me owning the shirt is true. The rest is not. <laughs> There's something about us that gets excited about things and wants to praise. And, and here's something you need to know about praise. Praise has content. It has content. There's something to it. So when we talk about God and talk about praising God in the place of prayer, what's really important is what we've found to be true about God, what we know about God in his character and in his attributes. So what you learn about God and his character and his attributes comes back into your heart and then you return it to him in praise. Listen to this in Psalms 89 and verse eight. It says, who is like you, Lord God Almighty? You, Lord, are mighty and your faithfulness surrounds you. Hear the, hear the tone of his voice 
I know we're, we're looking back hundreds and hundreds of years, but listen to the tone of the author here. What do you hear in his tone as he says, who is like you, Lord God Almighty? What emotions do you hear there? Your awe? Yeah. Reverence? Yeah. Something has captured his imagination in such a way that he can't help but put pen to paper and describe the attributes of God, and he, he comes off just sounding like lovesick. And listen to him again. He says, Lord God Almighty. Lord, he's saying, you're king. You're God. You're, you're the one true God. You're almighty. You have all powerful. In just these three words, he describes attributes of God that he carries with him for the rest of the psalm. He's learned something about the character of God that moves him to a place of praise. The less you know about God, the more sickly your prayer time will be. And the more driven it will be by your own needs and wants and desires. The more you know about God, the more time you'll have on your hands to praise. Listen to Psalms 145, starting in verse eight. Psalms 145 and verse eight. And, and th this is... Honestly, by far my favorite psalm of all time. The whole thing is good. We won't read the whole thing here, but the whole thing is good. And, and, and it's good to me because it's so densely packed with the character of God. Every line says something about who God is, about a new attribute of God. I want you to do something. If you have your Bible, underline every word or highlight every word that is an attribute or a, or a piece of the character of God. If it's in your iPad or phone or if you just got a mental highlighter as we read through this, go through and highlight every word that speaks of who God is. It says, the Lord is gracious. There's one. He's merciful. There's another. He's slow to anger. Another. Abounding in steadfast love, another one. The Lord is good to all, there's one. And his mercy, that's one, is over all that he has made. All the works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all the saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory, there's a part of who God is, of your kingdom and tell of your power, another piece of who God is. To make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Everlasting, it has no end. And your dominion, he has dominion over everything, endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful. There's a, you need to know this one. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works, another attribute of God. The Lord upholds all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them food in due season. You open your hand and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, and kind, there's the word again, in all his works. The Lord is near, he's not far away, he's near to you. To all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth, he fulfills the desires of those who fear him, and he also hears, he's not deaf, he's listening to you. Their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves, there's another part of who God is, he's a preserver, all who love him. But all the wicked he will destroy. Now listen to this last line that we're gonna read here. As the psalmist starts to realize something about the, the infinite goodness of God, he says, my mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Do you hear what he's saying? He's gone so far into the character of God that he started to realize that he could go on and on forever. He could literally go on and on forever like the angels who ever lived to stand before the Father just saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And just the one attribute of God's holiness can be spoken for all of eternity and never come to an end because that's how holy our God is. And our God is like a diamond, but a, such a multifaceted diamond that he could just turn a little bit and we get a new glimpse into a sparkle of some piece of his character and we get blown away all over again. And, and in our own flesh, in our own neediness, and our own weakness, we often want to skip over this piece of prayer and jump to our list of priorities. We're so driven by the, the hurt and the need and the sick and the that we skip over our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We have to stop and rethink what health looks like. C.S. Lewis said it like this. Listen, he said, the humblest 
And at the same time, the most balanced and capacious minds praise the most, while the cranks, the misfits, the malcontents praise the least. Except where intolerable, adverse circumstances interfere, praise almost seems to be inner health made audible. The, and don't you just find that to be true? Even if we take like, worship and praise off the table, not talking about God, but just the kind of people that walk around giving compliments to people and praising people for their work, don't they seem to be kind of the healthiest people? And the ones that walk around and grumble about everyone else and what's wrong with them and how they're the only ones that really work hard around here, you know, the cranky pants. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Cranky Pants showed up today. Great. They're the ones, there's something sick in their soul. There's something wrong with them. And, and listen, you can't get the cart before the horse. The way you get here is to search out who God is. If you want a healthy life of praise, then you have the responsibility to become a student of the character of God. Do you hear that? You have the responsibility as a disciple of Jesus to become a student of the character of God. And the, the lesson here is found in his word. Go to his word. Search out everything about the God that you serve. The more you find out about him, the more praise will flow from your mouth. I guarantee it. You will not be disappointed by the God of the Bible because he will show up to be the God of your today. And as you take the words that you meditate on and you start to then walk them out in your life, say, well, God, you're saying that you're a provider and you're calling me to do this thing, so I'm gonna step out and do it hoping you provide. And he does. He shows up and he's there. And suddenly, we, we have the word of who he is, and now we've got the experience of what we've learned from it and walked out. And both of those things feed one another in this feedback loop of praise. You know, um, there's an argument sometimes about the, if there's a difference between praise and worship, and people say, well, praise is one thing and worship is another. But the truth is, those are just the English words that we use to describe what's happening in Hebrew in the Old Testament and what's really happening in Hebrew in the Old Testament is there's over seven words just for praise and worship. They, they, they were extravagant in their praise of God. Extravagant. Some of their words were about, they used a, a root word like the throw because they would be throwing their hands up to God. Some of them have at their root this word dance. That's the one that scares us, isn't it? Oh no, is he gonna make us dance? No, I'm a terrible dancer. <laughs> but there's something, when it captures our heart, there's nothing we can do. Like falling in love with a girl, you're brave enough to walk across the room and say, will you dance with me? There's something about falling in love with the character of God that'll make you a fool. It makes you look a little funny sometimes. It make you uncomfortable <laughs> But what, what happens when a, when a man falls in love is he kind of throws caution to the wind, doesn't he? And hasn't hundreds and hundreds of Hollywood movies been made of just that? Guys running through airports, <laughs> looking crazy, <laughs> standing with boom boxes over their heads. <laughs> Have you stood before your God, the one you love like that? So praise is adoring God for who he is. Another part of this upward prayer is thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is praising God for what he's done. You hear the difference? Praise is really about just who God is. I can praise God for who he is as a healer even as I have a cold because it's who he is. Whether I am healed right now or not, my God is a healer and I can praise him for it. If he were to cure me of this cold right now, I would also be able to thank him for what he's done. <laughs> okay, not right now. I was hoping for a miracle here. <laughs> Patience, I'm being, I'm being coached from the front here. Patience. <laughs> 
Thankfulness is when we return back to him and say, God, thank you for saving me. Thanks for what you've done for me. I, I could never repay what you've done for me. But if I can't do anything else, thanks will never stop escaping my lips. I'll say it over and over and over again. Thank you, God. Where would I be without you? Where would I be without your forgiveness? Where would I be without your redemption? Where would I be without your healing of my heart? Thank you. Romans says that we actually uh, suppress the truth of thanks, Romans 1, in our brokenness, that we hold it back from him. And you know what that is? You know what not giving thanks is? It's like plagiarism. You know what plagiarism is? It's when you take someone else's work and you, you return it as if it's your own. You try to convince people that it's yours. And unthankfulness to God is plagiarism. It's saying that you're spiritually self-sufficient when you're not. You would not be able to make it without God. You need to give him thanks, credit for what he's done for you. If you're having a hard time with that, then it's time to stop and meditate on the word that says what he's done for you and then just return that until you start a habit of thankfulness in your life. Because here's the thing. There's gonna be times when thankfulness is really hard. When tragedy strikes and it's really hard to be thankful for any of it and it just becomes difficult. If in those moments you don't know the character of God and who he is, then not only will your thankfulness be temporarily stymied, but your praise will stop as well. And when your praise stops, your heart and relationship with God withers and dies. <laughs> if God's love is an abstraction, then it's of little consolation in times of trouble. If, however, it is felt and lived reality through prayer, then it lifts us at times when we sink low. So the reason why we start here in this area of praise is because it moves us to the next place. Because what happens when we get before God and we start to recognize who he is? We start talking about his goodness and his kindness and his holiness and his mercy and his everlasting love and his justice. We start... After we've praised, we kind of take a look at ourselves and we kind of look grimy, don't we? <laughs> we take a look at ourselves like, oh, I've just been talking about and praising the mercy of God and here I did not have mercy on my coworker when I could have. Oh, God, forgive me. I'm not like you. And, and we turn inward in a place of confession and a place of repentance and we start to, to wash our hands. We start to wash our feet, we start to bring ourselves before the only one who can forgive sins. It moves us. Have you ever, uh, this is the Northwest, we're not a very formal people at all. Have you ever showed up though somewhere to a party and you realize, oh, I thought this was a super informal thing and everyone's got a tie on and everyone looks nice and I don't look nice? And you show up to a wedding and you're in Bermuda shorts and, and you know, in a tank top and you're like, oh, what was I thinking? You guys are all dressed up. That's, that's kind of sometimes how, uh, when we come into the presence of God, one thing that you'll see over and over again in the Old Testament is, is prophets and people that come before the presence of God going, woe is me, woe is me. I'm unclean, I'm a man of unclean lips. And then because we're in his presence and because we're confessing, we get clean. We get justified. We get made to be able to stand in the presence of God by the blood of his Savior. So that moves us to a place of repentance. It moves us to a, to a place of, of confession. And we know that because he calls himself a redeemer. It's part of his attributes. It's part of who he is. But if we start here, if we started in this place of inward it's kind of hard for us to ever leave. We kind of can get stuck here because the inward prayer isn't only about our sinfulness, but it's about our need as well. It's about our sickness. It's about our, our debt. It's about our, our, our daily needs. And if we start with the daily bread, we'll, there'll never be an end of things that we need. <laughs> but if we start with the infinite, if we start with God, then suddenly when I approach this place of inward prayer, now I don't, I, I come with a completely different perspective but because I, I come understanding something about who God is. 
So I come at it knowing, you know what, God, I'm, I'm asking you for my daily bread today, and, and I know I'm asking a God who provides daily bread because I've learned that about you. And so some of the anxiety and the worry gets lifted from us already in the place of praise. Some of these prayers look interesting. <laughs> they look like a thief on a cross, cross saying, save me, remember me. In Luke 23 and 42, the thief says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And, and in the short span of time, he would have had to learn anything about the character of the Savior that he's hanging beside. In just that short span of time, he learned enough to be saved. I'm so thankful God takes sinners off the cross. He'll take you and he'll take me. Sometimes it looks like Psalms 51, David, someone who knew better and yet failed. You ever feel that way? You want to beat yourself up because you're like, I know better than this. What was I thinking? And we get in that stupid, stupid, stupid mode where we want to beat ourselves up. Well, David knew better. He knew to take it to God. And he says in Psalms 51, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Do you hear what he's doing? He's calling out on the attributes of God that he needs. He's calling specifically on his unfailing love and his great compassion. He started in the place of praise. It moved him to a place of confession and repentance. <laughs> Sometimes it just sounds like, help, <laughs> help. I just need help, right? What do we sing? Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> we don't sing that when we're driving, everything's fine, right? We sing that when there's a semi in our lane. <laughs> Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> That's when we're ready to give up control. When we've lost control, when we're, we're done, suddenly we're all, you know, oh, I remember my roots. <laughs> I'm going to call out on the name of Jesus. Lord, help me. I'm about to die here. <clears throat> Let's not uh, repeat that outside of here that I sang, <laughs> Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> Psalms 51 and 3 says, listen to my words, Lord, consider my lament. Hear my cry for help. Help. <laughs> when we come before an almighty God in praise and adoration and awe, we come before the one who can help. <laughs> when you complain, complain up. We often complain to our peers or to people below us. They can't do nothing about it. Complain to the one who can do something about it. <laughs> Take it to the God who delivers now, what happens is we've kind of moved through these stages. We've come to a place where we've praised God and we've spent a healthy amount of time there returning to him what is due him, praise and adoration. In the process, we kind of get moved to look at our own heart and realize, oh God, I need help. Please forgive me. This is where I'm failing and he does. And as he does that, he makes us more like him. He's, he's working in you the, the, the blood of his son into the image of his son. As, as he was a first fruit, you're becoming more and more like your God as you move through praise and confession. And now, as, as we get that cleansing, what happens is we start to look up. And we go, oh God, not just me, but them. We look around us, at, oh God, you healed me. How could you only heal me? Heal them too. Oh God, you saved me. Save them too, God. Have mercy on them. God, why me and not them? And we've moved into the third place of prayer, the, the outward prayer of intercession. Intercession is this great word. I love this word. Uh, intercession just means standing between. Standing between. You know what you stand between? You stand between people and what they deserve. Because the truth is, what we all deserve is punishment. The wages of sin is death. 
The wages of sin is death, and that's what we all deserve, but we didn't get what we deserved. We got instead the mercy of God through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, as we hold that place of mercy, that middle ground, we speak in between, and we say, oh God, have mercy on them. Wait, God, give them just a little bit longer. Convict their hearts, God, move them to a place of, of repentance. God, heal their, heal their diseases. God, do for them what you did for me. And you occupy the place of your Savior who stood between us and what we deserved. Now, no one can take the place of Jesus. Only Jesus can hold the place of Jesus. But when he says, pick up your cross and follow me, he's not talking about a piece of wood or some sort of weird self-flagellation where we just want to hurt ourselves for hurting ourselves' sake. When we suffer, we suffer for the lost. We pick up our cross for those who have not yet seen the cross. We pick up the cross as a demonstration of what Christ did for us and has done for them, but they haven't yet recognized yet. We stand in between in the place of intercession. Now, to be honest, our sinfulness and our brokenness, this isn't natural for us. We're slow to this. We have to practice this and get better at it. When I first started praying intercession, uh, it was brand new to me. It wasn't a part of my prayer life at all. And, and I got moved to pray for China. And I didn't even know what that meant. I didn't even know how to pray in intercession for China, just praying for China. God bless China. I don't know. Just bless them, God. Oh, there's a whole bunch of them. Just bless every, every one of them. You know their names. Just bless them all, God. There wasn't a lot of content. There wasn't a lot of, I didn't know how to pray. But the more I prayed, the more he gave me his heart for China. And I started wanting to know more. So I started reading books and looking on the internet and finding out more about them. So my, my prayers could have more content, can have more information. Started finding out that there's how many students there were in China and praying specifically for the students of China. Until pretty soon, prayer wasn't enough. And God said, you know, why don't you answer some of those prayers and go to China? And my wife and I end up on a trip to China, smuggling Bibles into mainland China. And after that trip, we're like, you know what? One trip's not enough. We gotta do this again and again until it didn't make sense to do short term anymore. We had to live there long term. See how it builds? It moves from small places of, of obedience to, to bigger steps of faith until we are changed in the process of prayer. I'm gonna ask our, uh, our ushers to get ready with the communion. We'll be taking communion in just a minute. I'm gonna ask the worship team to go ahead and come up. And I want to show you an example of intercession in the Bible in Exodus chapter 32, starting in verse 11. We have Moses. Moses is a great intercessor. Several times Moses stood in between Israel and what Israel deserved. <laughs> so they'd done something stupid or wrong or, or, or stubborn and pig-headed, and he got in between God's judgment and them and said, God, have mercy on them. This is one of the examples of that. It says, but Moses sought the favor of the Lord, his God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out, to kill them in the mountains, to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger. Relent. Do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give you descendants in the land. I, I promise them. And it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he threatened. Do you hear? I know there's a lot of information there, but just listen to what Moses is doing. He, he's reasoning with God. He's treating God as if he were real and having real conversation with his father, God. And he's even listing reasons. Well, you know, don't do it because if you do, the Egyptians will think you're crazy for bringing them out of, of slavery just to bring them out here and kill them. Don't do it because you promised your descendants that they would have more descendants. Don't do it for that. Don't do it because of your own mercy and grace. Have you done this? <laughs> Have you been moved to the place of intercession where you've, you've stood between? The, the elements that we'll be holding in our hand in just a minute as the ushers start to pass is, is a perfect example of this. Jesus, in the night before his crucifixion, he... 
He does what he's been doing for his years of ministry. He takes things around him and he starts to explain a deeper meaning behind them. And he says this, he says, this, this bread isn't just bread. It's my flesh. It's been broken for you. And this, this cup, this isn't just wine. This is my blood that's been poured out for many. Do you hear that? For many. There weren't many people in the room when he said that. There were a few. What he was saying was, this, this is poured out for you, but not just for you. And, and at that time, the disciples, before they even knew it, picked up an obligation that they would carry for the rest of their life that now lands on us. The place to spread the bread and the wine to many. We're gonna sing a song of worship here. I want you to, as the ushers pass out, just hold on to elements of communion until the end of the song. At the end of the song, we'll come back and we'll take them together. Would you praise God the Father with us as we sing this song?